The Biden administration's foreign policy efforts are once again in the spotlight as U.S. officials push for more hostages to be, to be released by Hamas. On that and what's ahead in the Republican presidential primary, we turn to the analysis of Capehart and Johnson. That's Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post, and Eliana Johnson, editor-in-chief of The Washington Free Beacon. David Brooks is away. Thanks, guys, very much. Great to see you. Happy day after Thanksgiving. Uh, Jonathan Capehart, I wonder if we could look at Biden's policy overall for Israel. How do you rate it right now? Uh, well, first, today is a great day that we have seen some hostages uh, of the couple hundred who have been held hostage in Gaza be released. And that is primarily the efforts of the United States, Qatar, um, Israel, but really the president of the United States pushing really hard to get to some kind of situation where hostages could be released, there could be a pause in the fighting so that humanitarian relief could get inside Gaza for, for the people who desperately need it, the Palestinians who, who desperately need it. It doesn't mean that this is by any means over or that there aren't more pitfalls to come, but with that incentive in the, in the, in the pause, meaning if 10 more hostages re are released, there, there will be an extra day in the pause. It is my hope that that in, does indeed happen and that this pause lasts longer than the four initial days. Eliana Johnson, what do you think President Biden should be focusing on? Uh, either this pause or, or relief into Gaza or uh, the release of U.S. hostages? I wish it was an either or question and I could give you a simple answer, but um, the president has to be under enormous pressure to secure the release of the American hostages. He's indicated that he does not know, even know the location of all the American hostages. And today we saw the release of 13 hostages. None of them were Americans. And I do think uh, he's under enormous pressure. He's got to get some American hostages out in this deal. Um, and going forward, he's coming under huge pressure from the left flank of the Democratic Party to pressure Israel to stop its war. And from my vantage point, the president has to resist that pressure and allow Israel to continue the war at the end of this pause. It is worth noting Hamas has already violated the terms of this agreement. Uh, the Red Cross was supposed to be permitted to see um, and evaluate the hostages. They were not permitted to do so. Civilians were not to return to the north of Gaza for their own protection, and Hamas is encouraging them to do so. Um, and so I think President Biden has got to give Israel the green light when it wants to do so to resume this war. Jonathan, let's think about that. Resisting pressure. There is a lot of pressure on the left, uh, some of it generational, but not all of it, uh, to call for a ceasefire. Uh, that is not something that many members of the Democratic Party have uh, followed. Uh, and yet, there are calls for the president to basically rein in the Israelis even more. Uh, can he resist that pressure? Should he resist that pressure? Um, he can resist that pressure. He will resist that pressure. And he should resist that pressure. Look, I, I would say to my friends, my Democratic friends, that we have to remember that President Biden is president of the United States, not the president of Israel. He has no control over Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He can strongly suggest, he can strongly uh, talk to him behind the scenes, more strongly than um, the words he uses, the president uses in public. But President Biden is doing absolutely everything he can to encourage a small d democratic nation, which has its own national security interests, to act in the best interests of small d democratic values. And I would also say to, to my democratic friends and to, and to others, you, you got to remember, for all the talk about President Biden being oh so old and he's too old for the job, well, his 36 years in the Senate, eight years as vice president of the United States is coming in, coming in handy right now when we most need it. This is the time when President Biden is at his best. He knows what he's doing. And I just wish that Democrats in general and the, and the American public in particular would, would give him the grace and give him the room to exert American, exert American will and American pressure as much as he can on a situation that is infinitely more complex 
than a lot of his critics uh, give it credit for. Eliana Johnson, when it comes to the power of the purse, uh, the president has asked for some $60 billion uh, for Ukraine aid, tying that to $14 billion for Israel. Uh, is that effort to tie Ukraine and Israel aid dead uh, or still alive in Congress? The Ukraine aid in particular is controversial among Republicans. Uh, I personally wish it wasn't, but but it is. And we've had Democrats come forward and say Republicans had wanted to tie additional money for the border. Um, and it, it currently is in this bill. And that is controversial among the Democrats. And so my guess is that ultimately uh, the Senate may come under pressure to split this bill into pieces. Um, right now it is the Israel money, the Ukraine money, and these border security measures. Um, I can't predict what will happen with that bill, um, but there are parts of it, the Ukraine bill controversial on the right, the Ukraine uh, money controversial on the right, and the uh, border security money controversial um, among uh, Democrats. So uh, I think it's going to be a tough sell. Jonathan Capehart, let's switch over to Republican politics. Basic question. Can anybody stop Trump? <laughs> right now, no. Uh, he is, what, last I saw, 20 or 30 points ahead of Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, who are battling for, for number two. But, Nick, what I really think we're, we're looking at right now is we're looking at poll numbers that show Donald Trump far and away the front runner for the Republican nomination. What I'm looking for is what happens on the night of the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primaries when those poll numbers give way to actual votes. And Donald Trump will be in trouble if his actual vote totals, his actual vote margin, assuming he comes in first place, is dramatically smaller than the huge leads we see he, he has over Ron DeSantis and, and Nikki Haley. And I think for, for um, the folks who are battling it out for number two, the person with the wind, at her, wind in her sails and at her back is Nikki Haley. Um, from the infighting we're seeing in Ron DeSantis's camp, I, the, the slide he's experiencing might be inexorable. Eliana Johnson, is uh, Iowa a must win or at least a must proving that you've got some positive momentum for Ron DeSantis? And is New Hampshire the must win or pro proving that you're gaining positive momentum for Nikki Haley? Iowa is a must win for uh, for Ron DeSantis. He has staked uh, so much energy on that state. And I do think he's got to win uh, there to keep his campaign alive. These guys are not running for uh, understudy or second place. Uh, they're running to displace former President Donald Trump and to win this nomination. And by the same token, I think Nikki Haley has to win one of these early states. She's performing best in New Hampshire. Um, I think Chris Christie has to drop out of this race for her to do that. His voters are likely to go to her. And a win in New Hampshire would set her up nicely for her home state of South Carolina, which comes next. Uh, of course, Donald Trump remains the uh, strong front runner, but we've seen crazier things happen. Never say never. There is uh, another debate, at least one more, between now and then. Um, and uh, poll, poll after poll shows that Republicans may say they support Trump, but they also say they're open to other candidates. So, uh, so we'll have to see what happens. I have 40 seconds left, and I will say that I am grateful on this Thanksgiving for my family and their support. So each of you have 20 seconds. Jonathan Capehart, what are you grateful for? Uh, Nick, I am grateful for science. Um, uh, on Sunday, I tested positive for COVID. So I've been at home since, since, since Sunday. And three years ago, right now, the nation was listening to ambulance sirens, sirens hearing about hospitals that were overflowing with people who had come down with coronavirus, folks who were intubated, folks who passed away without being able to see their family. And because of science, I got a positive COVID diagnosis. And the, the what, the most major thing that I've had to deal with were sniffles. <laughs> I'm thankful for science. And, and we are thankful that you are feeling relatively well. Eliana, you got about 20, 30 seconds. 
Nick, I'm with you. Uh, I'm grateful for my uh, my family, and it's particularly watching these excruciating scenes of families in Israel uh, pray for the return of um, for, of their small children, uh, many under the age of five. I'm grateful for the health, safety, and security of of my daughter, um, mm -hmm. and to live in uh, in what uh, hopefully still is the greatest country in the world. Eliana Johnson, Jonathan Capehart, thank you very much to you both. Thanks, Nick. Thank you.